Okay, I'm back with chapter, chapter two, Hurricanes. The making of a hurricane. Look at the picture. <clears throat> the making of a hurricane. Great whirling storms war out of the ocean in many parts of the world. They are called by several names. Hurricane, typhoon, and cyclone are the three most familiar ones. But no matter what they are called, they're all in the same sort of storm. They are born the same way in tropical waters. They develop the same way, feeding on warm, moist air. And they do the same kind of damage, both ashore and at sea. Other storms may cover a bigger area or have higher winds, but none can match both the size and the fury of hurricanes. They are Earth's mightiest storms. Like all storms, they take place in the atmosphere. The envelope of air that surrounds the Earth and presses on its surface. The pressure at any one place is always changing. There are days when air is sinking and the atmosphere presses harder on the surface. There are times of high pressure. These are days when a lot of air is rising and the atmosphere does not press down as hard. These are times of low pressure. Low pressure areas over warm oceans give birth to hurricanes. No one knows exactly what happens to start these storms, but when conditions are right, warm, moist air is set in motion it begins to rise rapidly from the surface of the ocean in a low pressure area. Like water in a hose, air flows from where there is more pressure to where there is less pressure. And so air over the surface of the ocean flows into the low pressure area, picking up moisture as it travels. This warm, moist air soars upward. As the air rises above the earth, it cools. The cooling causes moisture to condense into tiny droplets of water that form clouds. As the moisture condenses, it gives off heat. Heat is one kind of energy. It is the energy that powers the storm. The clouds are the source of the storm's rain. The low pressure area acts like a chimney. Warm air is drawn in at the bottom, rises in a column, cools, and spreads out. As the air inside rises and more air is drawn in, the storm grows. The air being drawn in, however, does not travel in a straight line. The Earth's surface is rotating and the rotation causes the path to curve. The air travels in a spiral within the storm. In the northern hemisphere, the spiraling winds travel counterclockwise, the opposite of the way the hand of a clock moves. In the southern hemisphere, they travel clockwise. I read the end cap now. Inside a hurricane, high winds spiral around the eye. But within the eye, all is calm. Air pressure within the eye is extremely low because there is less pressure on it than on surrounding areas. The sea under the hurricane rises in a bulge or dome. I'm going to start off with the caption. If hurricane's winds first blow from the east, they will blow from the west after the eye has passed. Most of these storms die out within hours or days of their birth. 
Only about one out of 10 grows into a hurricane. As high winds develop, air pressure falls rapidly at the center of the storm. This low pressure area is called the eye and it may be 10 to 20 miles across. The eye is a hole that reaches from bottom to top of the storm. Wind ranges around the hole, but within it, all is calm. Winds are light, the air is clear with blue sky or scattered clouds and sunshine above. People caught in a hurricane may suddenly experience calm air and dry skies. Sometimes they make the mistake of thinking the storm has ended, but it hasn't. The eye moves on and the second half of the storm arrives with winds blowing from the opposite direction. The storm of 1938 began as a low pressure area, probably in a region where hurricanes are often born, somewhere off the west coast of Africa. Here, ocean waters are 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. Winds carried the growing storm westward. The winds were produced by a huge high pressure area called the Bermuda High, which blankets part of the North Atlantic. These winds travel in a clockwise direction and they usually steer an Atlantic hurricane. Most often, the wind wheels a storm north as it approaches North America. By the time it reaches Cape Hatteras, the wind are willing it east, away from land. But this did not always happen. A storm may tear up islands in the Caribbean or come ashore in Florida. It may swing into the Gulf of Mexico and make its landing as far west as Texas or Mexico or it may move north to Georgia and the Carolinas. The 1938 hurricane did none of these things. One reason was the Bermuda High was not where it was supposed to be. Normally, it is centered over the North Atlantic in September. In 1938, it had drifted nearly 1,000 miles and was centered off Newfoundland. A second reason was that a band of low pressure stretched from Cape Hatteras through New England. The band was trapped between two high pressure areas, one to the east and one to the west. New England had had four days of warm, wet weather. More was forecast for September 21st. The band of low pressures formed a natural path for the hurricane to take. The hurricane took it, barreling along like an express train. It bore down on Long Island and the barrier beaches. Tides would have been high anyway because this was the time when the sun and moon were lined up with the earth. Their combined pool caused very high tides. The incoming tide was two feet higher than normal, even without the storm. Now hurricane winds added to the tide by blowing masses of water against the shore and holding them there. But the storm surge was far worse than the flooding caused by winds and tide. A surge is a bulge in the ocean under a, under a hurricane where air pressure is very low. The ocean rises, forming a bulge or dome. When the sur surge reaches shallow water near shore, it is slowed. It may then rise. Even higher as it did in 1938, because of the water piles up. A storm surge can do more damage than any other part of a hurricane. An extra high tide and storm surge topped by wind-driven waves. When all this water broke over land, it crushed the houses of West Hampton Beach 
swept clean the beaches of Rhode Island and flooded Providence. The wind in the first part of the hurricane were blowing from the southeast. Once the eye had passed, they blew from the northwest. This was the change in wind direction that put out the fires in New London, blowing the flames back toward areas that had already burned. In most hurricanes, water does the greatest damage, but not all that water comes from the ocean. The 1938 storm arrived after four days of rain in New England. Now more rain fell in torrents. In the Connecticut River Valley, the ground was already wet. It could not absorb more rain. Water rushed down hills and low-lying areas became lakes. Water rushed into streams and rivers, which swelled and overflowed their banks. City storm drains filled and streets flooded. The same four days of rain helped the storm travel as far as Montreal. Along the hurricane's path, there was plenty of warm, moist air to feed on. Only when it reached cool land north of Montreal did the storm come to an end. Weather scientists learned a lot as they worked out what had happened on September 21, 1938. They also set a goal to make sure that no big storm would ever again come as a terrifying surprise. In time, they would succeed, but first they need a better understanding of hurricanes and better tools for studying the storms. In 1938, their tools were ones that forecasters had been using for several hundreds of years. Some weather instruments. Ancient people who lived through great storms, they looked for signs that would help them predict the weather. They tried to explain the weather they experienced, but no one can really study weather. A barometer. A barometer, barometer, as a barometer, measures air pressure, rising air pressure, tells of fair weather, while falling pressure tells of stormy weather. This kind of barometer is often seen in homes and schools. Anometer, an anometer measures wind speed. The rate at which its blade spins outdoors is registered on a dial. In 1938, Hurricanes and other violent storms, anometers have blown away, making it hard to tell what the highest wind speeds were. The hygrometer. A hygrometer measures the amount of moisture in the air. The humidity. Warm air can hold more moisture or water vapor than cool or cold air. When warm, moist air is cooled, water vapor condenses changes from a gas to a liquid. That is why a glass of ice cold soda seems to sweat in summer. Warm air around the glass is chilled and water vapors condenses out of it onto the glass. A thermometer. A thermometer measures temperature. World names. In the Caribbean Sea, and North Atlantic, Earth's mightiest storms are called hurricanes. After a Carib Indian word for big wind, in the Pacific, they are also called hurricanes. If they occur east of the international date line, west of the date line, they are called typhoons, from Chinese words for great wind. In the Indian Ocean, they are called cyclones, an English name based on a Greek word meaning coil, as in coil of a snake, because of the wind that spirals within them. The storm also have a number of local names. Many Australians, for example, call them Wally Willies. The name probably began as Whirlwind, which became Whirly Whirly, which became Willy Willy. Earth's mightiest storms take shape over tropical waters. 
all move westward at first, then either die out over land or turn eastward, losing power over cooler ocean waters. For some reasons, these storms do not form in the South Atlantic or Southeast Pacific Oceans.